sticking around at the end of a long day. Uh, so this talk is all about comparative genomics, and we're interested in looking in um, multi-species whole genome alignments uh, to distinguish not just conserved regions, but also to distinguish conserved protein coding regions from conserved non-coding regions. So, good. Uh, so here I'm showing a, a few snips of a, a whole genome alignment of 12 Drosophila species, and I'm showing two regions from uh, the deformed locus, which is a Hox gene in uh, these Drosophila species. Uh, so I'm showing the, the 12 species uh, all lined up, the orthologous regions, as well as an inferred ancestral sequence at the top row. And uh, the region on the top is a uh, portion of the protein coding sequence of deformed. Uh, the region on the bottom is a conserved non-coding sequence from uh, an intron in deformed. And we're interested in using uh, evolution and comparative genomics to distinguish these two types of regions. So sort of comparative genomics 101 is functional regions are conserved, and that's true. Uh, but we have a protein coding region and a conserved non coding region. Their level of uh, conservation is sort of comparable. So we need to think a little bit harder to be able to distinguish those two things. So if you think about how conserved protein coding sequences would evolve, you can pretty quickly come up with uh, the types of features you want to look at. Uh, so for example, if I now sort of look at not just what's conserved, but what sorts of substitutions have been tolerated in uh, these two regions. And we think about classifying those types of substitutions, say, as synonymous or conservative amino acid properties versus non-conservative or frame-shifted regions. So all I'm going to do now is I'm going to paint up the uh, two alignments we're looking, and I'm going to color all the substitutions uh, according to that key. And uh, when we do that, we see that the two sorts of evolutionary signatures of, of Conserved protein coding regions and even highly conserved non coding regions are very distinct. Uh, so it's a pretty simple idea, and all we're going to talk about today is methods, uh, systematic methods for distinguishing those two types of signatures. So not looking just at conservation, but actually what you could call evolutionary signatures of what sorts of um, substitutions have actually been tolerated. So what I'll do is I'll sort of uh, briefly mention two existing approaches where if you, know, you want, went to the current literature and you want to do that, uh, the sorts of things you would do. And I'll introduce uh, our new method, which we're presenting uh, in this paper, uh, which sort of combines the best of those two approaches. All right, so uh, I'm sure you've all probably heard of DNDS or KAKS, or they're, they're kind of similar and related concepts. but. Uh, a method, if you went and downloaded, say, PAML, say, and you took your alignments and you, you fit various codon models. Uh, so a very sort of classical and nice way of asking that is based on this uh, DNDS, which is the ratio of the non-synonymous substitution rate to the synonymous substitution rate, the idea being that in protein coding regions, you expect a uh, much slower rate of synonymous substitutions, uh, or of non-synonymous substitutions, rather, uh, or omega or DNDS being less than one. So this model-based approach with the NDS is based on a phylogenetic codon model uh, where we have a phylogenetic tree with a fixed topology and some branch lengths. And then there's a rate matrix which describes a continuous time Markov process on that tree, modeling, how, modeling the rates at which any codon substitutes to any other. And uh, a sort of key feature of this DNDS test, which was sort of formulated in the 90s, is that that rate matrix, while it has sort of 61 by 61, or about 4,000 rates, it's very sparsely parameterized. So all of those 4,000 rates are determined by just a few parameters, omega or DNDS, which I mentioned, uh, kappa, which is the transition transversion ratio, as well as a vector of the codon frequencies. So that sort of sparse parameterization made sense in the 90s where there wasn't very much data to learn these things on. So we were uh, wanted, so you'd want to fit these models to say like one gene or one open reading frame. And so it didn't make sense to pile a lot more parameters into your model just because uh, you would totally overfit uh, them. So that, that sort of approach made sense when this was formulated. But uh, proceeding with how you would actually make a test for protein coding versus conserved non-coding based on this approach. Uh, you would estimate all these parameters for your alignment by maximum likelihood. So exactly just uh, you have those parameters and you maximize them, use Felsenstein's algorithm to compute the probability of the alignment uh, under the maximum likelihood estimates. You compare that probability to the probability of the alignment under the assumption that DNDS or omega is uh, one or not actually, or, or the non-synonymous rate is not actually reduced. 
And then the log ratio of those two probabilities, the log likelihood ratio, and that would be your test statistic, which sort of quantifies the evidence for a reduction in the non-synonymous substitution rate. Okay, so very uh, standard classical approach. And again, you would just download PAML and do this anytime. Uh, so again, that was sort of formulated in the 90s, maybe about five years ago, uh, where we were thinking, well, gee, we have a lot of data and a lot of known genes, so can we take a more empirical approach rather than this model-based approach? Uh, so we formulated something called codon substitution frequencies, which in contrast to the sparsely parameterized DNDS test was a very richly parameterized model, uh, or, or I, I shouldn't actually say model, but a very richly parameterized sort of discriminative approach, uh, where we took training data of known coding regions and non-coding regions, we measured the frequencies at which any, uh, any two codons substituted each, uh, at each other. And we used those frequencies uh, to then look at an individual alignment and assign a log odds score to any individual substitution based on the relative frequency of that substitution in the training data, known coding or known non-coding regions. And uh, we had basically, so that worked very nicely in, in the pairwise case. We developed a sort of ad hoc scheme for combining that pairwise evidence in the case of multiple informant species, which was fine, uh, but we didn't have a sort of phylogenetic model uh, modeling everything on the tree. Uh, the, the approach did outperform the, uh, DN, the DNDS test for short regions, which is what we were interested in looking at at the time. So that was sort of why we went with it. But uh, we felt that we could do better, and so that's what I'll talk about today. Okay, so the, we are presenting a new method called Philo CSF. CSF again is codon substitution frequencies, uh, where we sort of capture that key idea of using a richly parameterized empirical model from CSF, but do that within the context of a model-based approach uh, where we have a generative model of the alignment. So in Philo CSF, we again have a phylogenetic tree with some branch lengths, all this min maximum likelihood. And we estimate two empirical rate matrices from our training data of known coding and non-coding regions. Uh, so the sort of all the details and, and math of how to estimate this, uh, these rate matrices empirical with lots and lots of parameters were worked out uh, a few years ago. So there was an expectation maximization approach where we sort of reconstruct all the ancestral uh, of events and you know, refit the parameters and, uh, and, and converge uh, in the presence of uncertainty there. Uh, and it's about 4,000 parameters, where, so basically, again, every, essentially every, every individual rate in the coding matrix is again, estimated from training data and similarly from the non-coding matrix. So we have a generative model of the alignment. When we now want to examine a new alignment and sort of decide is it protein coding or non-coding, we can evaluate the probability of that alignment under the assumption of either the rate matrix we estimated from the protein coding regions in the training data, or the rate matrix estimated from the non-coding regions in the training data, and report, again, a log likelihood ratio between them. We'll also, uh, as a little detail, uh, control for the overall amount of conservation we see in the alignment. So uh, we're not, uh, again, asking, is it the region simply conserved or not? But we're very specifically asking, are the patterns of substitution we see uh, consistent with a protein coding pattern of selection? Uh, so there is a parameter rho, which we maximize over. And again, our sort of score that we'll assign to any given alignment, as far as its conserved coding potential, is that log likelihood ratio of the, mo of the probability of the alignment under the assumption of the coding model uh, versus its probability under the assumption of the non-coding rate matrix. And again, just maximize over that parameter. So I'll just run through a couple examples of applying this again in this deformed locus with uh, the alignment A1 taken from the protein code region, the alignment A2 taken from an intron, so that's the same alignment. So the two curves are, are sort of likelihood surface over that tree scale parameter, which is just controlling for the overall amount of conservation. Uh, so the yellow curve is the probability of the alignment under the coding model. The blue curve is the probability of the alignment under the non-coding model. Uh, so we choose the, the maximum under either of those assumptions and compare them and find that, well, this alignment is actually much more probable under the coding model. So this gets a positive score as the difference of those two likelihoods. We can then look at the non-coding region, which is again conserved if you looked at percent identity or something to about the same extent. Uh, but uh, the fact that the blue curve is now well above the yellow curve says that that alignment, that pattern of substitution is much more probable to have arisen under 
our non-coding model that we estimated from the training data. So that region will get a negative score. Not necessarily. You know, um, stop codons, there, there are frequencies. Some of these Drosophila genomes are low coverage, could be sequencing errors. So uh, you certainly wouldn't want to rule it out based on the presence of a stop codon. But certainly in these substitution models, that will have a very heavy penalty in, in the score as being very unlikely under the coding region. So the whole approach accounts for the uncertainty, I think, in the way that you would want it to. So uh, I, I won't go into all the details of the benchmarks, which you can read about in the paper. Uh, but we sort of, we have a we had a very established data set for comparing these just in the classification approach. The, these are just our rock plots broken down. Do we have a whole data set? Do we concentrate only on short regions? Do we take multi-way alignments versus pairway pairwise alignments? Again, I won't go into the details. But the new method, Philo CSF, uh, outperforms all the others and basically dominates them on these rock plots. And you know we're talking about. Uh, well, so one thing to note is that all the methods do very well. So we're talking about going from like 95% accuracy to 96% accuracy, which you can say is like only 1% increase, or you can say, well, it's actually a pretty substantial 20% decrease in the number of mistakes we're making. So I won't say much more about that. You can read about the performance in the paper, but the new method does very well. And then just one last um, one last thing about uh, the methodology, and then I'll I'll show you some uh, some pretty cool applications. Uh, so. Uh, like other, so there's a limitation of these phylogenetic codon models, uh, which is that they assume that the codon sites and the alignment are independent. So if you, if we're given an alignment consisting of n codon sites, the model and the uh, sort of evidence that the uh, the method is presenting to you assumes that that's like n IID samples of codon sites. But in real alignments, that's really never true for reasons of alignment coverage as well as as well as uh, cross site evolutionary rate effects like CPG effects and so forth. So, and it's, it's quite hairy to actually enhance the generative models to, um, to incorporate those kinds of non-independence effects. So rather than fiddle with the uh, generative models, we decide to introduce a, a discriminative component to account for these site-to-site uh, -site dependencies. And what that means is just adjusting that log likelihood ratio statistic based on the length of the alignment to account for the fact that if we have n uh, sites, that's not really an IID samples, it's somewhat less. And the dispersion of that statistic is different in coding and non-coding regions. So there's a transformation of the score based on, uh, based on the length, essentially, where uh, we, we, we transform it based on uh, a sort of dispersion parameters, uh, also just a few parameters also estimated from the training data. And in fact, uh, that allows us to get a nice additional boost in performance, where the, the red curve is the uh, log likelihood ratio statistic, and the purple is the uh, is the score adjusted in this way. So uh, this again combines a sort of generative and discriminative approach, uh, but we introduce a discriminative component to sort of compensate for a very particular shortcoming of the generative approach. So they complement each other nicely. Uh, so we have the software up on GitHub, uh, so you can go download it. Uh, we have uh, binaries for Linux and Mac OS X, as well as the source code. Uh, you have to supply the alignments to feed into the software, uh, which which is you know a, a bit of a pain. But uh, unfortunately, you know, for especially in the case of mammals, these alignments are tens and tens of gigabytes. So it's not really practical for us to include it with the software. So the software is sort of a component of a pipeline rather than something you can just download and, and use given your mRNA sequence or something. But a few other uh, useful features of it, it will search for high scoring open reading frames within an alignment that you give it. So, so that means you can give it an alignment of a transcript that includes UTRs or something and it will go in and, and find an open reading frame for you. And it also has a simplified mode that doesn't require as much training data or, or requires very little training data actually. So that's a bit more like the classical DMDS test uh, so if you need to work in a species for which we don't have the parameters available yet uh, because the training is quite computationally intensive, uh, you can still use the software. It won't be as accurate, but it'll still be quite useful. Uh, so you can go check that out on GitHub. So in the remaining time, I will just go through a few quick applications that we've used uh, the Philo CSF software for. Uh, the first one, and the sort of what we had in mind when we developed the software is, well, you know, there's all this high throughput sequencing now. 
there's evidence for a lot of novel transcripts and a lot of species coming out of this. And the high throughput sequencing, in contrast to microarrays or something, gives very precise exon structures for these transcripts. So we can use a method like PhiloCSF to go in and determine uh, and, and find sort of protein coding genes among those. So what I'm showing here is a region within a human gene, GTFE2. And uh, from the Illumina body map, two data uh, from high throughput sequencing as well as reconstructed transcript models uh, by a method called scripture from the Broad. There, uh, there's evidence for a novel transcript encoded antisense to an intron of GTFE2 and expressed only in, in brain tissue. Okay, so we went in and sort of evaluated this and found a 95 codon open reading frame, so just under 100 amino acids. And I'm showing that same sort of color alignments, but just, just with the colors, uh, just due to the length. And uh, you know, up on the 5' prime end, there's a conserved ATG. Uh, down 3' prime end, there's a stop core. In between, we basically only see synonymous substitution. So it's off the charts in terms of our model comparison. And uh, we're a part, we did this in the context of the GenCode subproject of ENCODE, which, which makes the uh, sort of reference human gene annotation as well as, as what's loaded in Ensemble. So in more recent versions of the Ensemble annotation and the GenCode annotation, uh, this is now annotated as a, as a novel protein coding gene. Similarly, in Drosophila with the MonEncode uh, project used uh, high throughput sequencing, as well as older cDNA sequencing techniques to identify a bunch of new transcripts in the last couple of years. So we also went in and, and uh, found um, protein coding regions in them. So, this, so there's, a, there's a neat new transcript here. This is our favorite example. It actually had two separate, very short, very highly conserved open reading frames showing these signatures. Um, it, so it's a disostronic transcript encoding two very small polypeptides. And just due to the length of those regions, it would have been hard to find without a method like PhiloCSF. Uh, the flip side of this, and something that, that we've been doing in a, number, in a number of species and collaborating with other people, is that if you take you know, your transcripts and you find that they don't have these kinds of signatures anywhere within them, okay, and you, know, you also look, uh, so, you, know, you also blast them and don't find anything, look for PFAM domains and don't find anything, well, you know, you're triangulating pretty well that those are actually non-coding RNAs. So we've collaborated in a, number of species, in a number of species and are continuing with a variety of people to help identify non-coding RNAs simply by ruling out uh, or, you know, making it unlikely that uh, there, are, there are protein coding genes within them. Okay, so the last application is kind of our favorite. Um, I'll, I'll just say a little bit more about this deformed locus. So before we're looking at a couple of regions up here at the 5' prime end, let's look at the 3' prime end, so the end of the open reading frame. Okay, so the, the purple column there is, is the stop codon of deformed. And you see about what you would expect to see. Upstream of the stop codon, you have this bias towards synonymous substitutions. Downstream of the stop codon, there's no such selective pressure because that region is not protein coding. Uh, so you see a lot of frame shifts and non-synonymous, non-conservative substitutions. Okay, exactly eliminated, uh, delineated by the stop codon. So that's exactly what you would expect to see if you flip through this kind of picture of the three prime end of the open reading frames of, uh, of you know, all Drosophila genes, you would largely see this. Uh, but you would see some exceptions. So here's one, uh, Kelch. Uh, again, the three prime end of this, where upstream of the stop codon in yellow, you have all the synonymous substitutions. But in contrast to what you would expect downstream, you also have a bunch of synonymous substitutions, suggesting that this region downstream of the stop codon uh, is still protein coding. So in fact, Kelch, uh, this gene is known to actually undergo stop codon suppression by a mechanism that's not fully understood. So the ribosome blows right through that stop codon under certain conditions. And uh, we see that reflected in uh, these evolutionary signatures where that region downstream of the stop codon, in fact, still encodes functional, uh, a functional part of the protein. All right, so we have this interesting signature here um, where this is what we expect to see. But when there's this unusual re, uh, stop code on read through or suppression effect going on, we see something very different. So we can apply phylo CSF systematically to the regions downstream of stop code on the volatile Drosophila genes and uh, see, well, how many, how many things like this can we find? And you know, if, you, if you thought about it before doing it, you'd say, well, there's some selenoproteins, a few weird cases like this. So maybe we think about, you know, we might be able to find a dozen cool examples or something. But actually, if you did that, which is exactly what we did, uh, there's actually kind of a shocking number that, that seemed to uh, score very highly right downstream of their stop codon. So there's, uh, so I won't go into all the details, uh, but we sort of thought very carefully about different things that could be going on other than stop codon read through. 
And we think there's quite good evidence, actually, that there's several hundred Drosophila genes that undergo Stockholm and read through, and moreover, where the sort of extension of that protein uh, as a result of reading through the stop code on, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, under purifying selection for a biological function. So here's an example. Uh, so this, this was uh, not known before we, uh, before we did this analysis, but uh, the, the alignment wraps here over two rows, but this is the annotated stop codon of this gene, khaki. Uh, so you can see that downstream of the stop codon, these uh, synonymous substitutions and protein coding signatures continue down to the uh, next stop codon in the sequence, which wobbles between two stop codons. And it's after that second stop codon that these signatures sort of degrade and, and the, the sequence becomes clearly non-coding. So again, this, this was not known. And uh, there's several hundred uh, genes in the Drosophila genome that look very much like this. So it's a pretty straightforward thing uh, to test. We have a very specific prediction there that for these genes, uh, downstream of their stop codon, that region is still going to be protein coding. Uh, so uh, our collaborators at University of Chicago uh, engineered these uh, transgenic flies where basically uh, they replaced the second stop codon uh, or inserted there a, a GFP domain such that if that first stop codon is read through, then that GFP domain will be expressed. It's a very simple experiment. And uh, also some accessory things around that to help rule out uh, alternative explanations. Uh, but in fact, this, this works for four out of the five examples that we found. So, uh, so we, we see this GFP expression in, in uh, pattern and, and very specific uh, approaches in uh, very specific tissues in the developing uh, fly. Okay, so quite a striking result. These, these are not weird, obscure genes. Uh, Zest is, is, uh, is involved in the polycomb trithorax pathway and chromatin, <coughs> chromatin remodeling. Abdominal B is a Hox gene. So uh, we, make, we make these rather specific and surprising predictions about these genes based on these evolutionary signatures and, and actually see them borne out in the lab. Okay, so uh, that's, uh, that's what I have for you today. We, uh, we worked on uh, distinguishing protein, uh, protein coding and non-coding region genome alignments. Uh, we went through a couple of existing approaches. Our new approach sort of com just combines the best of both. And uh, we went through a couple of neat applications. And so again, you can go download the software and uh, we think it's pretty cool. Uh, so just acknowledging my advisor, Manolis, and uh, Erwin, who's also in our lab, who, who has been spearheading uh, the, our recent work on that stop code on read-through application, as well as our other computational experimental collaborators and uh, a number of other people we've had useful uh, conversations with and uh, our funding. Thanks. <laughs>